Hello and welcome to this lesson for Higher Biology, which today is looking at the genetic control of metabolism. So previously till now, we've looked at how the metabolism of microorganisms can be controlled by changing their environment. And what we're going to look at today is how we can control their genetics, changing their genetics in order to allow microorganisms to produce different metabolites than what they maybe would naturally. So what you need to be able to do is name the processes by which organism, microorganisms can be improved and the methods used to induce these improvements. You need to describe the requirements for DNA technology and describe this process, including the use of a safety mechanism and explain the differences in the vector types, bacteria and yeast. So to get started, we're thinking about laboratory microorganisms and the fact that normally in a lab, any microorganisms used, so bacteria or yeast, are referred to as wild type microorganisms. And that would be our little green ones here. What we can then do is we can change these or mutate these bacteria and that would alter them ever so slightly. So we would wind up with mutant bacteria. So wild type bacteria or yeast are essentially unchanged genetically from organisms of the same species, which you would see in nature. And so new mutations are the only source of variation and new alleles. And it's possible to cause and create these mutants deliberately in the hope of producing improved strains of bacteria yeast or any other microorganism that we might be using. And there's a few main improvements that we might look for. We might be trying to improve the genetic stability. We might be trying to improve their ability to grow, grow on lower cost nutrients. We might be trying to produce large quantities of a target compound or we might be trying to improve them to allow easy harvesting of a target compound after fermentation is complete. So what we're really looking to be able to do is improve anything that makes their use easier within the lab. And there's a couple of different ways in which we can do this. Primarily what we're looking to do is change them genetically through some kind of process of mutagenesis. So mutagenesis itself is the creation of mutations. And in nature, as we know, mutations are rare and spontaneous and they are a cause of variation. So the rate of mutagen mutagenesis can be increased by exposing our organisms to different mutagenic agents. And there's two main, ty main types. We have chemical mutagenesis and we have radiation mutagenesis. So what we might try and do in order to improve the use of our bacteria or our yeast that we're using in our lab is we might expose them to some kind of chemical such as mustard gas, for example or we might expose them to some kind of radiation. And what we're trying to do is cause a mutation within those organisms. And we're hoping that that mutation is going to be a useful mutation and will lead to one of the improvements that we've just seen. However, what we can also do is instead of going about mutagenesis is we can carry out something called recombinant DNA technology. Within recombinant DNA technology, what we're doing is we're using our advances in DNA to manipulate it within the lab and improve our microorganisms, but more specifically than we, we could do through mutagenesis. Mutagenesis causes random mutations, and this allows us to cause very specific changes to the DNA. We know exactly what it is that we're doing. And essentially what we're doing is we're cutting a fragment of DNA um, from a known chromosome, and so in this case, for example, it's our insul insulin gene. And we're also cutting open the bacterial plasmid. When we do that, we're putting them together then. So we've got the target gene is being inserted into our DNA, our bacterial plasmid. And this leads us to a recombinant plasmid. So it's recombined in a different fashion. This allows our bacteria to then start expressing this particular target gene. So the process of recombinant DNA technology begins with the use of restriction endonucleases. And these are a group of enzymes that are able to recognize and cut very specific sequences of DNA. So you can see in this example, it's this particular enzyme has, is cutting DNA where it sees 
a double E and a double T. And what that does is because we're cutting the strand in of both our target sequence and of our plasmid, we're identifying the same section of DNA in both of those. And that means that they, we create something called sticky ends. So we've got pieces of DNA that have got unpaired nucleotides at either end of them. So that means that they will then be able to stick to each other. They're, they're then complementary to each other. So when we've cut out our target gene and we've also cut our plasmid, they are naturally attracted to each other at the right section by using the same endonuclease that's cut open the plasmid as has cut out our target gene. So the overall process is a bit more complicated than you have looked at previously. If we look at both our chromosomal DNA and our plasmid, which is this one here, they have our endonuclease recognition sequence. Now this is referred to as a restriction site. So these are our target sequences and that's where our restriction endonuclease is going to actually cut. So when they're cut, we're cut out our section here, from here along and cut out to there. So we've got where it's recognized this specific sequence and it's cut it. And then we've also cut our plasmid with the same endonuclease. So we have got a complementary section at either end of our plasmid. So we're then able to transfer our gene to be inserted, which is this bit here, into the sticky ends of our plasmids. We then use an enzyme called DNA ligase and that's inserted into our plasmid. DNA ligase is going to stick our ends together and form our recombinant plasmid. So when we look at our plasmid, there's quite a few different sections that can be involved in a plasmid and you don't need to know about all of these ones particularly. So we've already said that we've got our restriction site, that's the area where our restriction endonuclease is going to cut open the plasmid and we've got our inserted gene in this section. We may also have a regulatory sequence like a promoter up here and that controls gene expression. We've also got something called the origin of replication and that allows this plasmid to replicate itself. We may also, as a safety mechanism, have some kind of control gene which would prevent the survival of a microorganism in an external environment. So if it manages to get out of the lab, we've essentially controlled it somehow by, stop, by preventing it from surviving. We also have a couple of selectable markers. So in this one, we have antibiotic resistance genes and another selectable marker. Let's say this one is for luminosity. Now, a selectable marker essentially is allowing us to determine which bacteria have taken up our plasmid. If we've carried out this process, we've produced recombinant plasmids, now we're going to produce several of those. Now, what we then need to do is we need to get that recombined plasmid into some bacteria. So essentially what we're going to do is we've got our bacteria, we've got our plasmids, we're going to put those into our culture broth and we're hoping that all of the bacteria we've got in this culture broth are going to be able to take up some plasmids. We're also hoping that plasmid is going to be able to start replicating itself within our new bacteria. However, not all of them will have. So there will be plenty of bacteria in here that haven't taken up a copy of the plasmid. What we need to do is which one have done that. And this is where our selectable markers become important. So we may be looking for one which confers an antibiotic resistance. And in that case, what we would then do is having cultured our bacteria, we're going to put them out on an agar jelly plate. And this agar jelly plate would contain that antibiotic. So what we do is we're going to take our bacteria, the, this one has taken up our plasmid, it's reproduced and has produced more copies of herself, each one containing the plasmid they're all going to survive. They've got the selectable marker that contains antibiotic resistance to the antibiotic, resist to the antibiotic that's present in here. On the other hand though, this one, it didn't get the plasmid, it managed to take it up, so it was unable to produce the antibiotic resistance gene. Now for its cell walls have been broken down by the antibiotic, this one's gonna die. So after a few hours spent in on the agar jelly, the only ones surviving are the ones which have taken up the plasmid. So not only do they have this selectable marker gene, but they have the gene that 
target gene that we've initially put in there. So in this way we recombine our plasmids in more than one way. We may also give it a visual marker instead of an antibiotic resistant marker. In this case this is one where it's going to glow under UV light so it's one for luminosity and then again that's a quite quick way of being able to have a quick look and see which bacteria have managed to take up our plasmid to be able to identify it. Now it is possible occasionally to use yeast instead of bacteria as one of our vectors to put our plasmids into. It's often the case that instead of putting them into bacteria, um, we're going to express it into yeast instead. Now this is essentially the same way. So essentially you're going to cut our yeast plasmid or vector um, you're going to have cut for your animal plant or plant protein with the same restriction endonuclease. You created your sticky ends, ligase is going to put it in, and we've got our recombinant plasmid DNA to put into yeast instead. And there's often the reason for that is that bacterial DNA may not produce um, animal or plant protein genes properly. Um, often they don't produce active forms of the protein, rather they produce inactive ones. So yeast tend to work better for when we need an animal or a plant protein. So from that, you should be able to understand. <coughs> so from that, you should be able to understand how we can use genetics to control the metabolism of microorganisms. That the processes by which microorganisms can be improved could be mutagenesis or recombinant DNA technology. And the methods used to um, induce mutagenesis could be a chemical mutagen or it could be radiation. That within DNA technology, we require um, some kind of plasmid as a vector. So that might be our bacteria or yeast. We re require on our plasmid our regulated E sequence and we need a selectable marker and we need some kind of safety mechanism present. That the process of DNA, recombinant DNA technology is fairly straightforward, involving cutting out a target gene from our useful chromosome, and that will involve specific restriction endonuclease. We're also going to cut a section of our plasmid using the same restriction endonuclease, leaving us with sticky ends, able to insert our gene into the plasmid. And when we get our plasmid inserted into our bacteria, we're going to use the use of a selectable marker, such as one which confers um, luminosity or antibiotic resistance, in order to determine which specific bacteria have managed to take up our vector and are therefore able to produce the target gene that we're looking for. And that yeast are a more commonly used vector when we're looking for it to produce an animal or plant protein because bacteria don't often produce the active form of the protein. They're often folded incorrectly, therefore they're n inactive. Yeast, on the other hand, are able to produce both animal and plant proteins in their active form.